Hello, welcome to uh, Critical Line Item. My name is Tom Rabbit. Thank you for joining me for this particular podcast. Now, one of the things that you're going to see a lot more of is conversations about the role of artificial intelligence and the way in which large companies and governments and others use it to deal with problems. Now, uh, one of the areas of great interest that, that various think tanks and others have been looking at is how artificial intelligence can be used in in different forms in, in terms of detecting conspiracy theories on on large um, through large bodies of data such as you know websites like the ones managed by Google or or Meta i.e. Facebook and in other ways in terms of how disinformation and and misinformation can be can be weeded out. Now uh, it, it can be it can be a little bit complicated uh, but I've got someone who is very good at this, doing doctoral, the doctoral researcher in cyber security. You're going to sort of help sort this out. Um, Jean Lindestinko uh, is the, the doing a doctoral, uh, doc, is doing a doctorate, and, and I think she's just about done. And she'll take take us through some of the issues with AI and uh, various things that might come up in her research. Uh, Jean, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Now, um, we know there, there's a lot of uh, talk about disinformation and misinformation today, in part because of the fact that it's it has never been so easy to get published. Um, and and the bar has been the sort of the barrier to entry for publication has been lowered by social media. So traditional, the traditional means of things being edited, things being verified um, through few hands, no longer is the case. What are some of the problems that you're observing as you look at this area? From a research standpoint, and more generally, um, well, th- well, there, there's definitely the problem on on you know the open or too much information with regards to um, or too much um, crafting of information with regards to social media, and that's we we've seen in a lot of elections recently, not just. Um, even in my home country, the Philippines, it's been it's been a total um, disaster because it, um, um, yeah, uh, users are being bombarded with information from here and there, and they don't know where that information is coming from. Some people pretend that the information um, is is legitimate. Some people even um, consider that that information is 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 valid because it was spoken by someone. Who they just um, been following online? So that's that's uh, the validation of this um, kind of information usually um, escapes us because we 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 don't know where it starts, where it came from, and where it was going. And uh, as far as we've seen in many many elections globally, it usually always always finds something to target, and that is the creation of the in group and the out group. And that is the protection of the national identity that the that the uh, that the narrative on social media is is trying to to protect. We're saying we are being attacked, for example, by refugees. Um, we've seen that in India with the um, Rohingya crisis, saying that um, you know that 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 the uh, the the recent refugee crisis from Myanmar, for example, was. Um, a deliberate attack from from Pakistan to turn the country into an Islamic republic. So that, that's and and in the in the Philippines, one main concern is that they're trying to want to bring back the Philippines into its old glory. Well, I don't know what glory they're talking about, but it's always always about protecting or preserving some national identity, which uh, they're framing as it's being attacked. It's interesting you say that because there's there's another 
thing that goes on when these uh, messages are being sent out. If we assume that it's being done by people within a particular jurisdiction initially, um, there's also the phenomenon, isn't there, of uh, bad state actors leveraging that and trying to amplify discord and and dis and um, dissent within a particular environment, um, a bit like some of the stuff that went on during the uh, U.S. election uh, back in twenty twenty when. Um, some of the research that I read uh, found not all, well, not a huge number in terms of percentage, but enough to be of concern of the posts from countries like Saudi Arabia and um, China, etc., getting involved in that kind of uh, that mm. kind of thing. Um, how much is that a concern to you when you when you're looking at this area? Um, from uh, from a perspective of research. Sorry, you mean? Sorry, I, I didn't quite. The uh, the involvement of other people, uh, other other global actors in a domestic dispute. Right. Okay. Um, well, we've yeah, we that has that that particular thing is is a different like. Yeah. Field of study by itself, and it, it it merits a lot of more scholarly attention. But I feel like, um, because I've actually written a paper on how on how this um on how uh, small islands, for instance, because I'm from the Philippines, so I I hope that you it's okay. I use it as a, as a as a benchmark of everything. Uh, when, yeah. I, when I talk about, um, so I um, my I've written a paper which is um, about how small islands interact with this kind of um, changing global order, if if I could call it that, because recent in recent um, in Chinese investments in the Philippines, for example, has has been. Race has raised an alarm in the human rights community, particularly back home. You know, nonprofits and um, NGOs have been raising alarms because the Philippines has been um, opening more um, investment for power grades, or even um, which could you know lead to a lot of of of, of democratic um, um, problems and. Well, I'm not saying that it is particular. Well, it is bad, but I'm not saying that um, you know this kind of investments are 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 awful or anything. But what I'm trying to say is that small countries like my home country, or not even just small countries in 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 in, in size, but small country politically who are who do not have much voice in the international space usually find themselves between two colliding or in a collision between two rocks. And in that regard, it is really about finding the right spot so you don't get crushed. And it's it's really scary, scary times, but at this time we cannot, um, uh, with recent um, elections of uh, the Philippine President Duterte in 2016, he has been very vocal that the Philippines should go or move away from um, from the U.S. as its allies and uh, be more of a um, sign of friendly. And, and since then, we have seen higher levels of um, hacking attacks in our government websites because maybe... The other government wants to know if the Philippines really is saying the truth that it wants to be an ally with 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 them. So, uh, I we were majority of the attacks that we've seen back home are coming from China itself. Um, so that's that's another thing. It's about really finding a balance. It's there's nothing wrong with having you know good friends with your neighbors or an Asian superpower by itself, but it's really about finding balance. And it's really scary if you're a small country, like my home country, because uh, you always find yourself needing to choose between between the two. 
because if not, you get squashed. <laughs> it's a uh, it's an interesting period in in in, in global uh, global affairs for for that reason. Um, there are, I mean, that that naturally leads into the kind of work you're looking at in your doctoral research. Um, these things take a lot of time and a lot of work. What are you focused on? Um, so my main research is in analysing how the, you know, it's, it's on cyber propaganda and the, the um, analyzing how cyber propaganda travels from one country to another in the context of the global south. So that is um, Myanmar, India, and Bangladesh, particularly concerning about the Rohingya crisis in 2017, which has been proven to be quite, quite massive issue in that in that part of the globe. So my main argument in this in my in my study is that we always assume that the, the, the digital disruption is is a great equalizer. As as I've said, um, we've seen in 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 many many parts of the globe where social media has become a tool for uh, an emancipatory tool for um, many people in the grassroots as they've allowed themselves or find themselves. Uh, uh, people to, sorry, my dog is just, Heidi, no. So, um, so, right, um, where was I? Uh, yeah, so we've always said it was, uh, it was such a great equalizer because they will emancipate it. And that's, uh, that, but there's not really much um, um, research conducted than that, particularly with, the Egyptian revolution, we've seen that yes. um, the the um, the effects of social media was mo was more likely uh, just an after effect of a grassroots movement. But anyway, um, so you know, there's a similar view that found that, that the Chinese netizens, for example, in Weibo, in the issue of government. Um, corruption in China had wider variations as opposed to how the Chinese media and the Chinese government has has portrayed the story. So, you know, the frames that we've seen online were competing directly against the authority or the legitimacy of their government. But in the case of Myanmar uh, in uh, India and Bangladesh, it is pretty much um, the same thing as we're seeing back in Western countries. It's 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 um um i would say the emancipatory effects of um social media are contingent to the political environment of the country yeah. in question but this also means that if a country has restricted political rights and and, and freedom the positive effects of social media as a tool for change is amplified but this is also because social media operates as the main, if not the only outlet for expressing political opinion. But you know, this kind of assertions uh, somehow um, contradict the overarching narratives that online communication is emancipatory. And it does quite raise a point of inquiry on the hegemonic role of social media and democratic spaces. So by, by concentrating on the functions of social media as how would I say, as a radical instrument for change in authoritarian states, scholars like myself have we've overlooked the potential of social media to be used for propaganda purposes in countries who claim to be democratic but not a really established democracy. You know, and that was that is the the, the paint of the uh, the point of departure of my thesis. So I I, I try to explore whether. Um, national interests and government voices affect how citizens in their own country um, understand an unfamiliar event such as conflict or foreign war or even a refugee crisis. But you, you raise an important point that, and you're right, we don't often focus on, on certain uh, issues that relate to the regime in a country, uh, we, we do focus on the, I guess, the, 
you talk about the emancipatory aspects of social media. Um, we forget something, I think, and please let me know if you disagree, um, that the technology is agnostic, right? Technology is agnostic. So if we start from that position, you can have a revolutionary movement, but you can also have a, a movement or activity that counters that revolution using the same technology that, you know, the those people that are engaged in revolution or or, um, or a particular movement uh, are using. Um, do you think that we forget in, and now in the moment when people are... Uh, I've swept up in the notion of sort of revolution and how the communication, the ability to communicate and spread ideas had been sort of facilitated by social media that they forget the people they're fighting against had the same capacity. Right. Um, well, I would go back to what um, Kranzberg, first law of technology, says that um, you know technology is neither good nor bad nor is it neutral so we cannot I don't believe that it's particularly <laughs> neutral or agnostic <laughs> it's quite a contrary you know um, so because calling it neutral is the same narrative that marketers and big corporations are using to avoid accountability because they're saying that um, it depends on how the users use it but that also uh, you know, removes or moves accountability or shifts the accountability from big tech companies to the people so that um, if things happen, if things go bad, the consumer are the first one to blame. But I think that, you know, just that all algorithms or all technology are political and it is quite um, an, an epitome of privilege to say um, otherwise. So let me just explain that. So um, technology, for instance, uh, we've seen a lot of technology that has negatively affected um, people in the global south, as opposed to their um, counterparts in in the global in the global north. And we've seen that in many many uh, kinds of technology. Even the release of, of for example, of Facebook, for instance, where it became a very good tool um, to see to some. Um, some friends in Harvard, but now we have not, we're now seeing how it damaged uh, lives of hundreds and hundreds of people uh, or thousands of people in Myanmar and in Ethiopia because it's now being used as a tool to promote propaganda. Okay. Um, you know, so from issues related to privacy, right to equality, right and non discrimination, freedom of thought over surveillance. Um, technology has really affected global South people in a manner that we would not have seen, uh, seen elsewhere. Because a technology designed for the global North people usually does not translate well when just exported to the global South. So let me go to this um, research on inferential technology or, or, or the recognition methods to detect people based on their photogra photographs or online behavior, which is pretty much born out of the hyper-capitalist society that seeks to micro-target people so that they would buy their products. So tech companies, you know, now that have access to their consumers' inner desires, political leanings, preferences, likes and dislikes, emotions, which 20 or 30 years ago would have, um, would have been unthinkable. But what we often do not talk about is how this kind of technology is a validation of, uh, is uh, sorry, is a violation of our freedom of thought, which is itself an absolute right. So the thought of wanting to detect someone's um, identity based on data collection or data collection is really is, is really creepy. But this is tremendous impact if it ends up being used in global South countries where many of these identities are criminalized and even punishable by that, or countries where entities can use this kind of technology to um, 
uh, out people, uh, particularly, uh, no, the, the, for example, the LGBT community in, in, in many, many countries in the globe can be identified just by random photos they found online. And this has horrifying impacts to the relationship they have in the society. And that's, 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 yeah, those are just some of the few examples I can think of the top of my head, but that's, that's, yeah, but that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's interesting that it, it, the other thing that fascinates me is that it's not just the data collection of it, uh, data collection and, and what somebody within an entity, big tech company, whatever it happens to be, is able to use it for. Um, but what happens when somebody either inside or outside of that entity gains access to that intelligence, uh, which we've seen obviously through recent uh, recent case studies like Medibank and Optus, etc. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's the it's the harvesting of data, and then what happens to that data when? somebody else who has no entitlement to it on any basis takes it and uh, attempts to do something else with it. Um, and that's uh, that's a sort of contemporary concern. Um, the You are talking later this month at a forum on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, what you, what will you be focusing on when you uh, uh, have a chat uh, chat with people at that particular forum being convened by Monashuni? Yes, um, so that will be on the sixteenth of November. Um, we'll be here in Melbourne, and uh, I think on Lonsdale Street where they have their city um, office. And I will be a commentator. So um, our panelists will be giving case studies. And I will be able to, well, based on my experience, comment on that, particularly if it's anything about um, my research on the Rohingya crisis. But I will re I will expound more. Pretty much the same thing that I've, I've mentioned in the first part of um, our conversation is on how um, the Rohingya crisis or cyber propaganda about surrounding the Rohingya crisis has traveled from the government of Myanmar to the citizens of other countries and how it became or was, it is kind of still as considered an absolute truth by many, many of those countries because they're they're using that, as, as, as I've said, said a while ago, as, as a tool to legitimate, legitimize their opinion of Rohingya people. That if Myanmar government um, say that they are this and this and this and that, why would we in India or Bangladesh want to have them over here or in, in, the, in their country. Uh, Jean Linastinko is speaking at, at, and this is a hybrid event, so people can actually register for this and watch it online as well. Um, it, uh, just have a, um, uh, do a bit of a Google search for Monash University and how can artificial intelligence comment combat disinformation. Jean will be talking at that along with a panel of other experts. Jean, uh, where can people uh, see you know, some of your work if they're interested in following up um, some of the papers you've done? Yes. Um, I would have said that I am on Twitter, but not anymore. <laughs> I recently left the site, but I'm still on LinkedIn. Um, hope that things doesn't change, but I'm on LinkedIn. It's Jean Lina Stinko. I share a lot of things there. I write um, a couple of blogs, not just on um, data ethics and data um, uh, or tech in general, but I also write a lot about human rights because that is my, the foundation of where I am now. And um, yeah, just, just my name on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is where you live after after um <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it used to be Facebook. I was very, very um active on Facebook because um well I think everyone was at least for some time. But after the 2017 Rohingya crisis, which is my main thesis, um I've realized how they're quite you know not very active when it comes to 
the proliferation of removal of hate speech against this particular community. So I thought that I, you know, maybe I should practice what I preach and maybe I should leave. And then I did same went with Twitter and now I'm on just on LinkedIn and yeah. <laughs> Jean, uh, it's been wonderful talking with you and exploring some of these contemporary areas. It'll be great to chat again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.